Lady and clergy members of the Great Plains Annual Conference and congregations, the grace and peace of Jesus Christ be with your spirit. I'm sharing a revised version of the sermon I'm preaching at the Texas Annual Conference for the commissioning and ordination worship service this coming Tuesday night. But I believe this message is relevant to all baptized Christians, so I'm sharing it with you for this Sunday after annual conference, but you can use it anytime. I also invite you to open your hearts to God and to hear the message as if it were just for you, as we always should. My prayer is that you'll become a more committed servant of God in your schools, in your households, in your workplace, and in your communities. And only God knows, maybe you'll find yourself sitting one day with those to be licensed, commissioned, and ordained for ministry. I'm going to read from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. And this is a text, and I'm titling the message, Chosen. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. I'm going to read that again. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he, he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth from what end, what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give no other God, nor my praise to idols. See. The former things have come to pass, and a new thing I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. A reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 42. Let us pray. Eternal God of mercy, justice, and love, you promise that your words will not come back empty-handed, that they'll do the work that you sent them to do and they'll complete the assignment you give them. Anoint the preaching of your everlasting, living and active word as it goes forth and pierces our souls, our spirits, our thoughts, and the intentions of our hearts so that we may, by the grace of your spirit, bend our will and desires to be in unity and harmony with yours. Amen. Now friends, all of us have been chosen for something or other throughout our lives. Right? We've experienced the excitement of being chosen for a scholarship, a job, a promotion, a contract, a board of directors, a political position, a select cohort of leaders, a project manager, a place on a team, a task or an important mission to accomplish, or, or maybe even an award. Most of the time we're chosen because of the quality of our work, of our giftedness, of our unique experience, expertise, skill, our influence or maybe our past achievement. We're chosen because we have demonstrated competency and trust and loyalty and dependability. Sometimes we're chosen because someone else recommended us for the opportunity. Some things we're chosen for, like the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer so eloquently puts it, were suitable to our inclinations and interests and pleased us and made our hearts sing. We've also been chosen for other services that at first make our hearts sink. These are things that really do not suit our inclinations and interests, and to do them doesn't please us, and the only way we could do them is to deny ourselves in service of Christ and others. I've been chosen for several things in life that have made my heart both sing and sink. I'll never forget my first appointment and how my heart at first, truthfully, sank. I had all kinds of ideas about what my new appointment would be like, 
that I thought would please me. And then I received a call from my new district superintendent. He informed me that the cabinet had chosen and discerned and the bishop had appointed me to a two-point charge in El Paso, Texas. Man, I raised all sorts of objections and reservations in my spirit. I had a hard time accepting it, but I did because at that time I was a deacon, an ordained deacon, because that's the discipline, and I had vowed to the itinerancy. You know, it took me three months of prayer and discernment before I received consolation and guidance about what Christ wanted me to do in my appointment. And you know what? I can honestly say that the lessons I learned from my first four-year appointment in El Paso, the relationships I built with the people I served and came to deeply love, the leadership I was able to practice, and the experiences we shared in mission have helped me my entire ministry, even now as bishop. The prophet Isaiah presents an unnamed servant chosen by God. God is the one that chooses a servant. The servant in return freely chooses to be God's chosen instrument to accomplish God's salvation for the nation. It goes both ways. God chooses, but the servant accepts the, chosen, the chosenness. The chosen servant is supported and upheld, Isaiah tells us, by God's strength. God delights in the servant, and God permeates and inspires the servant with God's spirit. God gives the servant a specific task. That is, to introduce justice among the nations. The servant possesses no external sign of power, is not seeking publicity, and does not appeal or cry out to God when in distress. The servant works quietly, effectively, and persistently without dealing harshly with others. Weakness appears to be the mark of the servant, but the servant is strong in the strength and the love of God. We do not know the servant's name, gender, age, race, culture, background, educational attainment, economic status, social position, nor do we have the servant's resume. Scholars usually apply the identity of the servant that servant Isaiah talks about to Israel and Jesus. However, a servant of God could also be any person a family, a group of people, a church, a district, a conference, a denomination, or a nation that loves God, receives a prophetic call from God, recognizes a dependence on all creation, on God's order of justice, and accepts the mission to bring forth justice to the nations. The servant's work that Isaiah talks about would ensure that the world became a place where the powerful would not trample the powerless and where just laws protected the rights, humanity, and dignity of all persons. God sends a servant to bring justice to those described by the psalmist as crushed to the ground, sitting in the darkness, cut off from others like those long dead, whose spirits are faint within them and their hearts appalled. The servant is also sent to teach God's sweet and golden law to those on the coastlands, on the outskirts of the center of power. These are the disinherited people that Howard Thurman refers to as those that do not have any stake in the established social order, which are made to feel alien and are supposed to be grateful that they are allowed to remain alive and not exterminated. Isaiah tells us that the servant will not grow faint, will not be crushed in the quest to achieve God's justice for the nations. Now, whether or not the assignment to bring justice to the nations suited the servant's inclinations or desires is unknown. All we know is that the servant follows through on the mission. Nothing shall prevent the servant from realizing God's desire to bring justice and God's teaching to the nations. Now, as baptized Christians, God has chosen us. From the beginning, we're told in Scripture, before we even knew it, God's prevenient grace. And we have chosen God through Christ in the power of the Spirit. But our choosing comes with a calling as well to serve as ministers in the world, doing good works in Jesus Christ, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Friends, we are at an inflection point in the life of the church and in our world. Our world, and particularly our nation, has been through mass trauma over the last year. 
the pandemic, the racial unrest, economic uncertainties, and hyper-partisan politics have exposed hidden tensions of systemic biases, hatreds, fears, inequities, and injustices that were always there and have now been brought to light. We've seen things that we can't unsee. We've heard things that we can't unhear, things and realities we can no longer deny or ignore as disciples of Jesus Christ. At times, things seem to be falling apart. Like me, I'm sure that you have thought a lot about what it means, as Micah says, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God as we do our part to ensure that society operates smoothly with equity and justice. Some of us have had some level of head knowledge about justice and maybe have done justice on a small scale, but doing justice hasn't fully really settled into our hearts as part of our discipleship to the same depth that doing mercy has. An illustration that has helped me understand the difference between mercy and justice is found in the story about a great city with a large river running through it. One day, one of the members of a congregation was walking beside the river and heard a man in the middle of the river calling for help. He dragged the wounded man to safety and took him to his congregation where he received much care. The next day, the loving congregation sent the prisoner back to the river, and to his surprise, he found three more people calling for help. The members worked hard together to care for the three who they had rescued, but day after day, there were more and more and more people coming down the river, and soon the rescuers and the resources were nearly exhausted. Finally, some of the members of the congregation stopped long enough to figure out a better plan. They had a church meeting. You know those? And during those church meetings, a member suddenly jumped up and shouted, why don't we go up the river and find out why the people are being hurt and work with them to do something about it? You know, if we are to learn how to do justice, we have to find people that act justly, and then emulate them, doing it ourselves. Maybe you have a relative, or a church leader, or a community leader, uh, a friend, or a national leader, or a historical leader that you can watch and learn from and then emulate. Maybe it's Jesus or one of the prophets in the Bible. I have several persons that have exemplified a life of justice and how to do justice. My dad is one of them, for example. And then there's Gandhi, there's Nelson Mandela, Cesar Chavez, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., and Ryan Holdneber. In the beginning, when we practice justice, because we have to practice it, it may feel awkward, even fake, because we're copying someone we've seen do it. But over time, to, ju to do justice becomes an ingrained part of our character. At one point, the desire to do justice will just begin to manifest itself when we need it, even when we don't think about it. As baptized Christians chosen by God to bring justice to the nations, we're called to arouse people's consciousness over injustices like Jesus Christ did. Throughout his ministry, Jesus awakened people's consciousness over their injustice, expressing and highlighting the highest respect for God's higher moral law. God's law, the way of life. There is a gap. And Jesus pointed, at, pointed that gap out and helped people become aware so that they could meet up with God's law for all humans, for, for a law of, of mercy and justice and peace and freedom. And what Jesus did is he didn't create the tension. He just brought to the surface a tension that already existed so that it could be seen and addressed. And so to do justice is not something that we do separately from our life in God. To do justice arises out of a deep abiding in the life of God. Because the more that we abide in God, the more that we begin to understand the heart of God. The more we begin to embody the mercy and the justice and the love of God in our lives through concrete actions and words. So as baptized Christians... We're all chosen servants of God, called to do our part to establish God's peace and justice and freedom for all people, starting with where we live and then moving out into the world. In closing, I want to lift five defining marks of God's chosen servants that I find in this reading from the prophet Isaiah. Number one, 
As chosen servants of God, we rely on God as the source of all we are and do. And here's the thing. When we do justice, because we love God and because God cares about others, God delights in us. God breathes life into us. God gives us strength, bathes us with the Spirit, takes us by the hand, inspires us with the gifts of faith, hope, and love. Psalm 106.3 says, Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Friends, it's a blessing to do justice and righteousness at all times, we're told by the psalmist. Number two, as God's chosen servants, we transcend racial, ethnic, and cultural peculiarities. The servant is sent to the nations, not to a unique or homogenous people group, it's sent to the nations. So from the very beginning, the justice of God and the love of God was a universal hope for all of humanity. So in short, God's servants are, because of the gospel, anti-racist. The early church was a new creation. Pentecost, which we just had last week, reminds us that the Spirit of God reached out to people of every race, language, and nation. From its onset, the church was a multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural, and multilingual enterprise. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, the dividing walls of hostility that separated people were destroyed and dismantled. We affirm, as chosen servants of God, the ultimate and sacred worth of all persons from all nations. And as chosen servants, we reject expressions, attitudes, behaviors, ideas, racial hierarchies, and policies that suggest one racial group is inferior or superior to another racial group in any way. For all people are created in the image of God. That we affirm. We affirm that racism is a sin and plagues our relationship with Christ since it is antithetical to the gospel itself. The third thing we learn from this text in Isaiah. We bear witness to God's peace, justice, and freedom for all the nations. As God's chosen servants, we take the suffering of others seriously. You know why? Because God takes it seriously. We're just expressing the heart of God here. We see the suffering in, the, in our world through the eyes of God. We hear it with God's heart. We act to alleviate it with God's mercy and justice. We keep alive the pastoral prophetic flame for peace, justice, and freedom for all people to which the entire church, all the church, is called to bear witness. As baptized Christians, we bring the good news of God's justice into the social, economic, and political spheres of life, as Brendan Leahy, an Irish Catholic bishop, writes. He says, it's a baptized that move out from the gathered communities to the structures of society to Christify, I love that word, Christify the worlds of politics, mass media, science, technology, culture, education, industry, and work. As you live out your faith in these areas, the world experiences God's love and justice and is transformed from within by Christ's redeeming power. Number four, that I like, fourth thing I'd like to point out, a servant of the Lord, a chosen servant of the Lord, doesn't tire out, doesn't quit, and doesn't stop until God's salvation work is finished and until God makes all things new. Now that means that the project is not going to be finished within our lifetime. So we have work to do. There will be times in life that will try our souls and make us question our faith and calling. We will at times wonder if, man, is what, we're, is what I'm doing really making a difference out there? Is it all worth it? I've had those times visit me in my life before I was in ministry and, and even in ministry. And then there will be times when you feel like you're just going to quit. Well, don't. The writer, Psalm 73, talks about the temptation to quit on God when he says, As for me, my feet almost stumbled. My steps nearly slipped. And he asked himself the question, Have I in vain kept my heart clean and washed my hands of innocence? But then he encounters God in the temple. He encounters God in worship, and he changes his mind, and he changes his heart, and he, sings, he sees things differently. And he says, Although my flesh and may fail. My heart may fail. God is my strength 
and my heart and my portion forever. Remember that God has chosen you from the beginning and God will give you power when you're faint and strength when you're powerless. Like Paul, in those moments when we feel like giving up, we commend ourselves to God in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in dishonor, in bad report, in good report. When we are sorrowful, we can in the Lord always rejoice. When we are poor, we make many rich in God. And when we have nothing, we possess everything because God is always near. God is our strength. God is our portion. And God is our refuge. And then lastly, as God's chosen, we are agents of faith, hope, and love. The virtues of faith, hope, and love are mentioned together three times by Paul in the New Testament epistles. Virtues are not feelings. They're part of our essence and character as a people of God. These are theological virtues because we learn how to have faith because God shows us what faithfulness is. We learn how to have hope because we know that we can trust God. We learn how to love because God has first loved us first. So these are what we call theological virtues. The more we practice the virtues of faith, hope, and love, the more they become part of our character. Faith is a confidence that people of every nation, from all tribes and all peoples and all languages, will turn to God for salvation and healing. That's in Revelation. Our hope in God is a dogged and deliberate uh, commitment. Tom Wright, in his book, Paul, a biography, puts it this way. Even when the world seems dark and we, we have hope that God who made the world can be trusted to sort things out in the end, to be true to his promises, to vindicate his people at last, even if it is on the other side of terrible suffering. And our love is grounded in God's love for us and embodies our faith and hope and concrete actions on behalf of God in the name of Jesus Christ for the sake of the world God loves. You know, it's not easy to be God's chosen. <laughs> Rev Tevia in Fiddler on the Roof is talking to God all the time. And in one of the scenes, he says, you know, God, I know that we're the chosen people, but for once, could you choose somebody else? <laughs> Being chosen is not easy because it, it has a mantle of responsi a missional responsibility, not just for ourselves, but for the world that God so deeply loves. It flows out of God's heart of love and it manifests itself in, right, in righteous actions in the world uh, and acts of justice and mercy. It's not always easy to retain faith, hope, and love in the face of our human experience. There are just too many disappointments and disasters abounding all around. Sometimes we seem like we're going backwards into greater incivility and justice and violence and equity rather than moving forward. But, you know, we don't lose sight. We don't give up. We just keep moving forward, relying on God, our source, the source of our life, seeing God's image in the other, bearing God's witness to God's peace, justice, and freedom for all people, and holding on to faith, hope, and love until God's will on earth is done as it is in heaven. So, God's chosen ones, may the grace, peace, and love of God be with you now and forevermore. Amen.